Green crabs are being called the cockroaches of the sea. That's because they're virtually indestructible. For years, they've been ravaging marine ecosystems everywhere from New England to the Pacific Northwest. But that doesn't mean they're not delicious. That's why a distiller in New Hampshire is turning them into whiskey. Will Robinson uses 80 pounds of green crab to make just one batch. It has the funk of the crab, but the spice prevents that from being harsh. And chefs in New England are adding the invasive species to the menu. I'm not gonna make a crab ice cream yet, but I may go that, that far. <laughs> so what is the true cost of the green crab invasion? And can we ever eat or drink enough of them to make a difference? Will's making his fourth batch of Crab Trapper. For each one, he buys roughly a thousand live crabs from a harvester on the New Hampshire coast. But these guys, uh, I don't work with them without gloves. Will's been an environmentalist his whole life and loves pushing the boundaries of what can be added to whiskey. Part of this, why it's made a big story is because of the ick factor in using crab in a spirit. But I don't think I've had anybody taste it who was put off by the flavor at all. He slowly simmers them for 20 minutes, so the aromas don't cook off. Then he mixes the crab-flavored stock with the distillery's house-made spirit in a vacuum still that stays at a low temperature. A lot of the flavor molecules and, and aroma molecules are very delicate, so those would break down if we were to boil them in a, in a regular still. Crab flavor alone isn't very appetizing, so he adds a blend of eight different spices. Coriander, mustard seed, dill seed, fresh bay leaf, paprika, allspice, clove, and cinnamon. That's all combined with the distillery's base bourbon to form the final product. I didn't drink while I was driving, but I kept a small vial in my vehicle so that when I would pull up at a stoplight, I could smell it and be like, oh yeah, no, this definitely works. Will hopes his concoction will inspire others to get creative with green crabs. They don't have a whole lot of meat. However, if we could create a soft shell crab market for them, it would be huge because they have fantastic flavor. And that's exactly what harvesters like Mike Macy are trying to do by catching and selling as many as he can. Let's see how we do today. That's a good start. Mike used to teach marine science at a local high school. Now he catches green crabs for a living, thanks to fisheries specialist Gabby Brought, who came to speak to his class about green crabs. We just talked a lot about the abundance of the resource and the quality of the product, and it just got to the point where I said, someone's got to give this a try. Mike had been following the species for years, <laughs> but this is the first season he's harvesting them commercially. He's one of the few making a tiny dent in a huge population. So how many of them are there? As many stars as there are in the sky. <laughs> the exact number, I can't tell you. Certainly enough to threaten Maine's $890 million fishing industry. Back in the 1800s, these stowaways probably made their way to the U.S. on trading ships coming from Europe. But no one really noticed until the 1930s, when fishermen saw that green crabs were eating all the shellfish. Females can lay eggs up to twice a year and produce about 185,000 eggs at a time. And they have no predators. A pretty decent sized green crab can eat up to 40 mussels a day or 40 soft shell clams a day, and they can dig up to eight inches. From 1948 to 1958, soft shell clam production in Maine fell by over 80% as green crabs became more and more rampant. If you have too many of them, it's not just your seafood that goes away. It's a lot of your biodiversity and our marsh habitats. Like eelgrass meadows that green crabs damage when they burrow for shelter and dig for prey. Eelgrass is a plant that can help stabilize some sediment in the bottom of estuaries. But more than that, it's a fabulous nursery habitat for commercially important species. New England's harsh winters used to keep crab numbers down. But now scientists say warming waters due to climate change are giving them a chance to thrive. While there haven't been any major recent studies, it's clear they're still wreaking havoc everywhere from New England to Washington. In 2021, the Lummi Nation found more than 70,000 crabs in one 750-acre saltwater pond over just a few months. It was roughly 30 times what they'd caught just a year earlier. While there are national strategies in place to tackle other invasive species like Asian carp, there isn't one for green crabs. But environmentalists and chefs are pushing hard to create a market for harvesting and cooking them. And it's starting to catch on. 
Americans don't have a really broad palette <laughs> for seafood, so introducing a good but new concept in terms of a culinary ingredient takes a little bit of coaxing. In places like Venice, soft-shell green crabs, or moeke, are a delicacy. Gabby says the challenge in the U.S. is getting people to understand that invasive doesn't mean inedible. The problem is they're tough shells, so the key is to catch them during the tiny window just before they shed their hard shell and grow a new one. They're only going to be soft for, I mean, really paper-thin soft for maybe 12 hours. Mike has 20 traps throughout this estuary, baited with two small herrings each. Sometimes the uh, seagulls pull the bait bags out. One crate alone can catch 40 pounds of green crab overnight. That's equivalent to about 400 crabs, or enough for a couple hundred bottles of crab whiskey. When they come up in the traps, they are all going to be hard shells or very recently molted crabs that are of really no use to us except to be sold to the bait market. Those only go for about five cents each, roughly 50 times less than what a restaurant-worthy crab would bring in. That's a freshly molted male, freshly molted male, and those are all missed opportunities from this spring. But Mike has a plan. Their molting season only lasts about two months. Males typically molt from May to July, while females molt between August and early October. They put the ones with the best chance of molting soon into crab condos. This one on top, being the much larger one, is the molted crab and a soft shell. And what's left behind is its discarded carapace. This one's looking like a pretty good product. It molted with all its legs and claws. You can see it's kind of fresh and shiny on the bottom. Others that won't molt for another two to three weeks are stored in crates. Trapping is still happening at a pretty small scale, but it could potentially work. Between 2010 and 2012, nearly one million crabs were removed from an estuary in Nova Scotia. Eelgrass habitats and softshell clams slowly made a comeback. Just south in the coastal waters of Maine, the goal is the same. There's no way that we'll ever be able to eradicate this species. The idea is just to bring the population down to a dull roar. And what better way to do that than by convincing people to eat them? Even though green crabs are one of the most common crab species here in New England, it's pretty hard to find them on menus, and you're not gonna be able to go up to any old fish market and find a green crab. Mary Parks founded greencrab.org in 2017 to showcase recipes that might encourage people to give them a try. And remember how crabs lay 185,000 eggs at a time? Turns out they're pretty tasty if you cook them right. You're just gonna take your nail and pop off this back of the carapace. Inside here might not look super appetizing to some, but if you scoop with a spoon towards the back of the shell, what you'll reveal is this beautiful bright orange row. Mary sautés the row for a few minutes with olive oil, pepper, and white wine. Then she combines it with sweet corn and garnishes the dish with dill, basil, one shallot, and chili oil. She often buys the crabs online in frozen three-pound packs from Wolf's Fish. 120 pounds of green crabs are delivered to the warehouse weekly. The goal is to get these critters out of the water and onto plates. Everyone in the seafood industry is concerned about green crabs, and there's a wonderful opportunity to use that abundance and make something delicious. At Alcove in Boston, the furlong bisque named after the late harvester Mike Furlong has been on the menu for about five years. I got a small amount of them, and I made the bisque, and it just knocked me out. My customers loved it. Saute them a little bit, and then, and this is the most important part, is you want to just sort of break them open a little bit. That's how the dish gets its deep flavor. So you can make a bisque with blue crab or lobster, but green crabs actually have exponentially more that dark, roasty ocean flavor you really want. Once it's cooked, the soup is blended, pureed, and strained. This is the finished bisque hot. See it nice and thick and creamy looking, but there's no cream in it, no dairy. That is until it's garnished with a scoop of mascarpone. And then uh, one of my favorite herbs to use for this is chervil. It's one of the uh, fien herbs, they call it, and that's it. So far, this is his only green crab-inspired dish, but he doesn't want to stop there. They're an invasive species and they're delicious, which is a twofer.